This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Paraswap. You'll hear more about them later on in this episode. Oh, it's such a wonderful day. What is up, everyone? I am Charlie Shrem, and you are listening and watching Untold Stories, where twice a week together, we get to dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders to really understand how this movement came to be, where we are right now at this moment. We're celebrating Bitcoin's all-time high today, $66,000. It's amazing, and it's continuing price discovery. But we also want to know where we're going in the future, because as it is now, this is when it starts to scare people. And I get scared too, because where are we going? What are the next things to invest in? What should we be focusing on? Where should we be, you know, maintaining our family's, uh, you know, wealth? What should, how should we be starting new businesses going from zero to one? There's all these crazy, crazy uh, questions. And hopefully on this show, we give you some light and some of these answers. Um, and I'm very excited today. We have an amazing guest, Mauricio Di Bartolomeo. Thank you so much, Mauricio, for coming on Untold Stories today. Thank you for having me on, Charlie. It's uh, it's uh, I've been a fan for for a really long time, uh, and, and really uh, uh, I guess happy to be here and because of, you know all you've done for the space. So it's uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I still have like so much of this imposter syndrome sometimes too. So when you say that, it really does mean mean a lot to me in more ways than anyone could ever understand. You have a crazy story too. You came from Venezuela around in in two thousand three. You moved to Canada. You are, you know, that success story started Ledin.io. And what's so beautiful about Ledin is you've kind of used things that you've learned from your childhood growing up in a high inflation, very socialist, communist country, uh, seeing on the ground what that was like, and then using that, discovering Bitcoin in, in late 2013, early 2014, and building Ledin and using all of those like negatives and positives from your life to create this, you know, such an awesome company with awesome tools that enable people's enable people to not only um, borrow against their Bitcoin and be able to never have to sell it, but at the same time going above and beyond from a, an industry standard by really pushing for things like proof of reserves and, and getting attestations by, you know, third party auditors, because we've learned so many times over that the problems that'll screw up our industry can only be caused by us. We are the reasons that we put ourselves in bear markets. We created Mt. Gox. We created Quadriga. So we need to continue uh, 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 doing all of these things. Thank you so much for coming on Untold Stories. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, it's... Uh... It's it's a bit of a dream come true in in some ways to to um, to have been able to have this opportunity uh, to to sort of be a part of the Bitcoin industry and and build you know I think that I joke sometimes because when I first discovered Bitcoin and I was in Venezuela I would you know as I was saying earlier I was like as I was going down the rabbit hole I was listening to you guys uh, you know you and Eric and and I heard people like you know Char uh, I think Laura Shin had one of the first podcasts out yeah. there. Uh, and I would listen to her podcast all the time. And I would and I would look at all of you, you know, participating in these, you know, being in these podcasts and building in this industry and 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 launching these these new services. And I, I thought, you know, in some ways I looked at, at you guys as like a professional sports players, right? The same way you would turn on the TV and you would watch like, you know, LeBron Dunk uh, or or someone else, but they're doing what they love. You know, they show up every day, they get paid to do the funnest thing. You know, in their view, right? And and I would look at that and like imagine, you know, being able to wake up and Bitcoin every day and have that be like our job or your job. Yeah. Uh, and 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 we get to do that. You know, every day, uh, our 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 company, it does feel almost like when you were young uh, and you were playing sports with your friends. Everybody just loves what they do. Everybody has a smile on their face and like they're wearing the jersey. Like we all rep the brand. Nobody has to tell us to wear anything. Uh, it's like this internal pride that comes with. Uh, with building in this space. And and the other beautiful thing about this is that you get this sort of immediate feedback from the people that you build for, right? Uh, you, you put out a product and within Real-time minutes- Real-time feedback loop. Yeah, like within minutes, you, you're hearing from people all over the world. It's like, hey, I like this. Hey, cool, great job, guys. You know, keep it up. Uh, and so it's like, it's like you have almost like, a, I don't know, I, 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 I equate it to pretty much like, you know, playing the sports that you love, uh, being in the industry that you love. So it's a, it's a true privilege. You know, you've 
if well, first of all, thank you. And if 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 I'm the LeBron James and you're the Michael Jordan or the the late Kobe Bryant, well, still alive. I, I don't know if I could say that. I I loved Kobe Bryant. I thought he was one of the best. Shaquille O'Neal, but I'm too short to be Shaq. So <laughs> you seem like you're a tall guy. You know, it's it's so interesting as you say that. At the same time, I was here in the U.S. where we were competing with the banks down the road. Where here you were competing with your broken financial system, and here you are now. How many years later, and you've built almost like just through lead in, you know, and utilizing crypto, but you've built a suite of tools and services that rival almost every bank in the world. So it's almost like you've created this to give back to your community. Do you think about that? Do you ever think of the moral implications? All the time. Uh, and in fact, so a big a big part of of our sort of impetus to to build that in and to build it the way we did was that from the early days. So I guess maybe maybe to step back, I think that one of the biggest things that has plagued uh, people in, in Latin America, and not necessarily Latin America, this goes to really any country that doesn't have a reserve currency. The United States, in the way the fiat system is structured, the United States is the last fiat domino that can fall because it is the backbone of the entire domino system. So... We are seeing the domino in the United States kind of do this, like start to shake now because they've printed all this money. And, and for the first time in almost my lifetime and many people that are around today's lifetime, we're seeing people be like, wow, they are printing a lot of debt. Whoa, can they service that debt? Those questions weren't even in the Overton window, oh, you know, God. like you know, 10 years ago. But like I said earlier, the United States is the last domino. I and many others, and people that have lived in the dominoes further down the road, we've seen fiat fall. Like we know how fiat falls. This isn't their first sort of, you know, fiat, you know, demise party. Uh, you know, to give you an idea, in my lifetime, Venezuela has removed 14 zeros from the currency. It's renamed the currency three times. So uh, myself, people from Lebanon, people from Turkey, people that have seen this show before, we start seeing some of the same signs. So right now, even today, in the current sort of United States inflationary system, there's still this veneer of hope for the working class to acquire an asset. And by that, I mean, a person at a school can say, oh, if I get a job at X and I save for five years, I can make a down payment for a property in the United States. The path to wealth in most developed countries has been the path to your first asset. If you look back to the 50s United States, it's always about home ownership, own your home, you know, own an asset. If you talk to any Italian that is like, you know, any, any, any old school Italian will tell you, do not sell property. They'll tell you, you buy property, you own property, right? And so investors have been able to, to basically make, preserve and multiply their wealth simply by buying that first asset and borrowing against it. And when you take out it, when you borrow against it in fiat, and this is a mortgage, uh, that is a system that is designed to do well. For example, fiat is designed to become weaker over time, right? When you're borrowing, when you're basically borrowing fiat to buy a house, you can look at that as a long house position, but in fact, is a leverage short on fiat backed by a house. You are borrowing fiat to buy a house that to buy an asset that basically has a, 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 a lower supply schedule, right? So as fiat gets printed, the value of that house in fiat units will go up, and then you will double down on your short, aka you will refinance the, 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 the house. And all this is is you really just taking that first asset and borrowing against it, and you're letting fiat do its thing. When if, if when this plays out for a little long enough, the, the the speed at which assets appreciate in an inflationary environment is much higher than the speed at which your salaries inflate. Yes, exactly. And so sooner or later, you'll get into this disenfranchising chasm. And once that chasm is hit, it means that the people that are working, even if they save for 20 years, will not be able to afford a down payment on an average house. When that moment happens, you disenfranchise the entire working population from this asset system, this race, and they start feeling like they're left behind. I'll give you an example. It got to a point in Venezuela where the person that was filling up the tank for your gasoline 
would make actually this is this is probably a, a more direct example did you know that in venezuela a full-time worker at mcdonald's with a full day's job payment could not afford a big mac wow Jesus so Christ. when when that happens you start your your mind your incentives go out of whack because you can no longer save or get to to a wealthy status through honest work you know the numbers just don't add up through honest work you have to right. look for other things the wealth gap starts dividing correct and then the wealth gap starts poisoning your incentives to the us start- is going through this right now yes 100% and it's not a big issue right now because People are still too busy looking at their balances and their, sa- their savings accounts. Right now, the United States have more accumulated savings than they ever have. But they don't know that they're staring at a precipice because they're not looking at asset prices. They're basically still too busy trying to plan their vacations to Mexico, right? And when they come back and they try to buy that house, they're going to say, whoa, I'm never going to afford this house. Or it's going to be really hard for me to afford this house. I don't, I don't want to be alarmist. I don't think we're actually necessarily quite there in the United States. Right now, I think there's still this idea that you can work through honest work and buy a house. Like, don't get me wrong. It's one thing. It, it, this happens gradually. First is like you yes. can't afford a house. Then it's that you can't afford an iPhone, right? Like it starts getting really bad. I live on the water and I have a seawall, a very long seawall that was built a very long time ago, made out of cement. And if those who know seawalls like dikes and, you know, things like that, They're based on very, very calibrated pressure between the water and the land against the cement. If over time, one of them becomes imbalanced, if there's too much water seeping into your grass, over time you see small cracks. And if you don't, not even cracks, but just you see the grass dipping a little bit. And if you don't do anything about it, if you don't fill the shell or figure out what the crack is causing that crack, it's very gradual, but just like that. It goes. Yeah. And, and so I guess just, you know, going back to why I, I'm so excited about what we do is because typically the assets that can preserve their value over time are very expensive. They're very high price tickets. They're properties, uh, even cars, you know, to some extent they, they do it. They're, they actually are okay in an inflationary environment, but they're, they're you know, at, at hyperinflation, they just, they, they taper off. They, you, you, they're not as liquid. Um, houses, you know, it's very hard to save up to buy a house. It's very hard to save up to buy a car. It's it's impossible to buy gold in most places. But people can now start slowly over time acquiring Bitcoin. And that Bitcoin has the same asset appreciation potential on a notional level, just on a pure fixed supply versus variable yeah. supply of fiat. It has the same or very similar asset characteristics of future appreciation than does, say, a house right? Or anything that has a fixed supply relative to an infinite supply of printed units. And so people can now start slowly acquiring Bitcoin, their first asset. It is, and, and this, is, this is where I think this is a huge shift in this sort of availability to investors to access these high quality assets. If you were a person in Colombia, in Mexico, in Latin America, and you read the same sort of macroeconomic news and information that everyone reads, and you know that inflation is coming in the United States into the dollar, into your local currency, how do you protect yourself? How did you protect yourself? It was impossible for them. Until Bitcoin, an average Mexican couldn't show up and buy an ETF for US real estate or buy you know, a small unit of something that would preserve its value. But they could buy now, dollars. They can buy dollars, but what happens if you know inflation is coming to the dollars too, Charlie? You stop buying dollars. And so and the buy biggest what? buyer, you buy Bitcoin. The biggest buyer right. of dollars should be not the U.S. It should be everyone. That's, the dollar's whole basis is that the fact that everyone else is buying it. We export our inflation. But if you, like you said, if people stop buying dollars and if even if there's a small fissure or crack that we start to see, I mean, it's just, it's just the beginning. It, it, that's the thing. Like people, for example, like myself, like I've seen inflation happen in, in Venezuela. Now I'm seeing inflation come through the Canadian dollar, come through the US dollar. What do we do? Right. Like if Bitcoin didn't exist, I would be probably deep into property, real estate, something, stashing my cash somewhere else. But now that I know Bitcoin, 
I believe that Bitcoin will basically perform better than some of these other assets. And my personal decision is to hedge my inflation against Bitcoin. However, before Bitcoin, you couldn't do this. Before Bitcoin, a person in Mexico had no choice but to own dollars and just bite inflation uh, because it was the best, the least worst of all the options. And so Bitcoin does give you this ability to level up your ability to hedge. And now a person in Colombia can basically take a little bit of their paycheck and go hedge inflation with the same tool that Michael Saylor is using to hedge his billion dollar company. And I think that's a huge shift because as a Latin American, you know, growing up, you don't have the same access to investment instruments that you do in the United States. An average person can't buy stocks, in, you know, Apple stock or Netflix stock, but now they can buy Bitcoin. And that's empowering. It's empowering to you to know and to understand that you have the same asset as your, the investor who you're the biggest fan of, right? And you're basically hedging with the same yeah. tool. One of the biggest lies they teach in universities and in schools in America is that the dollar stays the same. It's the biggest lie. They never teach you that the dollar against other assets will change constantly. And even in economics, people with economics degrees, they're so stupid. I'm sorry, but modern monetary theory, every civilization that has ever arbitrarily printed debt over a long period of time has ended in ruin. You can't do it because psychologically, why would we put our money into something that we know is just going to inflate, not even by our control? Like, at least with Bitcoin, you know what the inflation schedule is for, for hundreds of years. It's a beautiful thing. Let me ask you, though. You're right. So so the normal course of a, of a human being goes through their certain ages. They uh, uh, come of age and they decide that and, and the all over the world buying your first home has always, or starting your first business, you know, investing in human capital, but really buying an asset that exists outside of you is always been, I mean, back to thousands of years, because no matter what happens in the world, the earth is finite. The, you know, building a house takes a certain amount of energy required, building materials and costs. So you can't just put it up, but then, and this is what I want to touch on at some point in your life, most people, most people, most people who own homes will, like you said, refinance that home. They will borrow against it to start a business, a catering business, a, a painting business, electronic software, anything. Help borrow against it, buy some Bitcoin. People will be doing. And that is their pathway to upward mobility and then, and then eventually retirement. Up until recently, Bitcoin was never really seen in the larger crypto space as this thing that can be uh, an asset for the future because you couldn't borrow against it. Now, how has that changed? Well, that was precisely why we got so excited to build Ledin, because we, you know, it came from, from a few reasons. So one is the way wealthy people have always perpetuated their wealth is by borrowing against their assets. It's by understanding the fiat system, right? Like if you know that the fiat system, the fiat units, whatever, let's not call them dollars. If you know that units of fiat are being produced at a faster pace than units of house or units of Bitcoin then it makes sense if you can borrow fiat against that house, essentially at a lower rate than fiat is scheduled to be produced, then you will be essentially doing great because you are, um, you are borrowing an asset that is designed to become weaker over time and you're investing in an asset that is designed to have a fixed supply over time. And so this is, uh, you know, this is really how the wealthy have perpetuated their wealth. If you look at a, a, a rich person's portfolio, like they don't really sell their property. They just borrow against their property. They invest in another asset. They let that asset rise and they borrow against that asset again. Yeah, my accountant a different one. was teaching me that. He was trying to show me how his, you know, wealthy people will actually just live off of the cash flow created from businesses that they've started borrowing against their assets. Exactly. And so, and what happens is, First of all, you never sell that asset. So even though the asset has appreciated over time, because you are not selling it, you don't have to pay capital gains in most jurisdictions because you're not getting rid of the asset. You are just utilizing an asset's new higher value to obtain more financing, to invest in a different asset that can then also appreciate over time. So really this was to us, um, now to, based on that premise alone, we think Bitcoin is the world's greatest collateral because you can trade it 24-7. It has the deepest liquidity. It is infinitely divisible. 
And so, you know, if somebody partially defaults on a house, you can't go and sell a room of the house, right? But if somebody is partially defaulting on a Bitcoin loan, you can sell a little bit of that, whatever's needed, and then settle that amount and keep the loan going. And you can do that 24-7. You don't need to go through a long withdrawal process to get ownership of the house. So for that alone, we think Bitcoin is the, the sort of greatest uh, asset to finance. And the other piece is that, you know, when, we, when you have a Bitcoin business, which we did, I was a miner and I was trying to grow my mines. And the only way to grow our minds as a Bitcoin business was to reinvest the Bitcoin we had already earned. Exactly, yeah. The opportunity cost on that, any business, any Bitcoin business person will tell you is so high. Um, and all we wanted back then when we were trying to grow our minds in Canada, this is 2017, we just wanted a Bitcoin back loan and nobody would give it to us. And so Adam and I, like my co-founder, we, we were kind of looking at each other like, why isn't someone doing this? Like, this is... This is a no brainer. This is a mortgage for Bitcoin. Why isn't anyone writing, like you know, issuing mortgages for people's Bitcoin? And um, we looked around and there were not really, you know, there was nobody really offering it. There was one company offering it, but they had tokens and all these things. And at the time, you know, we said, we just want to create a very simple business. You know, the simpler, the better. That way we can, you know, we always wanted to do proof of reserves and, and, and find a way for clients to be able to verify their balances. And we knew that the more tokens and the more complex the business got, the harder that was going to be able that was going to be to do. Uh, and so we kept the business really simple, focused on Bitcoin. Um, we expanded into USDC because of our Latam clients all really said to us, "Hey guys, I love I love the loans. I don't have a dollar bank account to get those proceeds in, and I don't want to get it in my local currency. Can you please send it to me in a stable coin?" And so this request came up so many times, uh, and we noticed that people in Latin America were finding so much benefit in USDC or stable points that we created a USDC savings account. And I guess just to, in a nutshell, because I don't even think I've touched on it, but the products that Latin has today are savings accounts for USDC and Bitcoin. So we let clients earn interest on their USDC, but that's at a 9% APY actually at that rate, and, and Bitcoin is 6.1% on your first to Bitcoin, and then two and a quarter after. And we have Bitcoin back loans. And those are Bitcoin back loans in dollars for people that essentially want to get financing to grow their business or diversify. And then we have our B2X product, which is a loan that takes the Bitcoin you already have to borrow against it and buy more Bitcoin. Uh, and that's actually our, our most popular loan product. Uh, but those are that's in a nutshell what we offer. It's pretty simple. And then you can also trade in between your USDC and your Bitcoin within your savings accounts. Uh, we have a bunch more stuff coming, but that's the core suite today. Do you think uh, uh, these products will expand beyond um, collateralizing Bitcoin for just interest only loans? Do you think you'd see like long term 30 year mortgages eventually through the securitization of properties? Could it be considered like a basket of assets? I mean, theoretically, someone could create their own index fund of their own assets that are worth, let's just say, five million dollars and then borrow against that. That's the world we're getting to, right? So I, I can't, you know, uh, spill the beans on, on some of the stuff that we're working on, but oh, uh, we, <laughs> we, we are working on some really innovative stuff. Uh, to your point, uh, Charlie, it's, it's more about how do we make, you know, borrowing against your Bitcoin less stressful? How do we make it simpler? How, do we, how, do we, how can we take away the sort of, uh, how can we make our clients feel, you know, sleep better at night, uh, you know, bar borrow for longer? Uh, have a have a like you said a, a more stable collateral pool that is not at you know as as much at risk at the variabilities or the price of Bitcoin. I, I you know that's what I'm really excited about is is essentially how you use Bitcoin to unlock a, a plethora of even newer and like just more innovative financial systems uh, that that let people do more. Sorry to interrupt your regularly scheduled programming, but I wanted to tell you guys that if you're using PancakeSwap, Uniswap, DYDX, SushiSwap, you're doing it wrong. You need to be using PowerSwap because PowerSwap is a user interface, a decentralized smart contract platform that sits on top of all of these. And when you go to PowerSwap or untoldstories.link forward slash PowerSwap, because they're refunding your gas, if you go there, then you'll be able to, on top of Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain and Polygon look for the best prices for your tokens and swap and do everything in one predefined transaction on chain. Instead of having to do the approval to this token, to that token, to do all these different things, Paraswap does it all for you. It's decentralized. They just released their API version five that you can see everything. It's all open source. Very cool stuff. Untoldstories.link 
forward slash Paraswap. If you're using any of the other decentralized protocols, you're doing it wrong because you need to be using the routing, beautiful Paraswap routing system, and it's fully decentralized too. It's gorgeous. I'll talk to you guys soon. Like in the early years, I was giving away Bitcoin to a lot of people. Like if you'd catch me at any conference, I'd be giving away Casatius coins, which are trading at like one Casatius is like 1.4 Bitcoin now. They're selling on scarcity. It's insane. I was giving these things away. I was looking at old invoices to Roger Revere where I was like paying him 50 Bitcoin for just a roll of 50 Casatius coins. Give them away. Um, reason I'm telling you this is there's this guy, this Lexus guy. I call him Lexus guy. He's a nice guy. Lexus guy, I gave him a Bitcoin in 2012 and a Casatius coin that he forgot about for many years. And um, over those years, our lives, you know, split. I knew him from New York City days. And this was 2012, so maybe a little under 10 years ago. And our lives split. We both went to do our separate things. He went to go on and actually sell used cars. Um, that's not why I call him Lexus guy. But he ended <laughs> up going out to sell cars and stuff like that, going through the normal course, meeting his wife and having his first child and stuff like that, going through the mobility of, of, of renting and then wanting to buy a property. And like you said, everything stayed normal in the same. And here we are. We spoke last year, 2020. And Bitcoin was, I forget, it was maybe around $40,000 or something like that, or, or $50,000 at the time we spoke. And we were just chatting around how this asset that he still has, has completely appreciated that he spent like that he spent nothing on, essentially. But there was nothing that he could have ever owned at the time that would have appreciated but at the same time, it enabled upward mobility because you know what he told me? You can't buy a fraction of a house. And I'm like, oh my God, you're so brilliant. <laughs> you're so right. You can't, the thing is, yeah, you can. You can buy real estate investment trust. You can buy a piece of a Zillow share. But by the time all the taxes and the fees and all the bullshit are involved, you end up losing. You're the chump, you're the fish. You need to own the property. Your name's on the tax roll. You can't buy a fraction of a property. You can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. And that to me, he was like, Charlie, for the past years, every month, I've been buying small amounts, small amounts. So I like your BTO2X product. That's really cool. And I'm a big fan of like, I'm a big fan of, I'm a big, huge fan of, I want everyone to go through the same chances that I had because I had, when I was younger, uh, nothing. And then I made some money and then I was stupid and I lost it all. And uh, you know, I went to jail and everything, and then the world gave me a second chance. And so I want, I really want to show people, the point I do the show is that uh, the world loves a second chance. So if you feel like you screwed up the first time or if you've made mistakes, dude, I, I'm here from a second chance and so can you. And using Bitcoin to get you there, you know, is what I try to preach every day. A hundred percent. And I, that, those are, that's a beautifully said. And, and I think this, this idea of, you can't buy a fraction of a house. To me, this is this is one of Bitcoin's greatest attributes is the fact that it lets people escape the asset trap. Going back to the point I made earlier, the big assets that hold their value were most, most often big tickets that people were priced out of. And now people can actually buy a fraction of, a, of the best asset, I would say, of arguably the highest inflation. Or you know, if Paul Tudor Jones prefers crypto over gold right now. And you can be buying that too as a person in Colombia or Mexico to protect your own portfolio. I, I can't stress enough how empowering that is as a person in those countries. Um, because even here, it, while some people might have access to buying REIT units, your point, a fraction of real estate, but even then you're still pretty much a chump relative to owning the asset. But even that's out of reach for the majority of people uh, in the world. So I think you know, at Lenin, for example, like we have clients in 127 countries. We wow. love that. And, and many times when people come to us in, in places in Latin America, they say we are the first loan they've ever been approved for, which to us is music to our ears. That is, you know, Bitcoin inclusiveness in action. And I think that this concept of borrowing against your Bitcoin, the beautiful thing about this now is that it's completely global. Until Bitcoin, if you were a person in Mexico and you wanted to access financing to grow your business, you could only look for people in Mexico, banks in Mexico. If those banks would pick up, you're done. And now, when, if, if you're a person in, in Mexico and you have a Bitcoin, there are companies now competing to lend against that Bitcoin. Oh, I never realized that. It, it, it basically, it, it, it opens up the world of financial systems. It, it, Bitcoin financial services 
are true are the first time oh. in my in my life that there has been a truly globally accessible set of financial services. Bitcoin doesn't care who you are, what you look like, where you came from, what your social status is, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone competes on the same level. So like, I don't know if you had the same uh, textbook growing up, but in, in the textbook, I remember learning about social studies in like the fourth grade and the social studies class, learning about the, the caste system in India. Now you have different levels and stuff like that. And they showed the lowest caste was this like little guy who was cleaning the sewers and he was like had his little head smiling sticking out of the wind the, the shit all over his face if this guy owned some bitcoin that he was buying on his paychecks swiss banks are competing for his shit cleaning business money it's insane a hundred percent it's a hundred percent it it makes it accessible and 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 Many times these things were set up in the way that they would just protect the wealthy already, right? Like you wanted to protect your markets. You, you, you wanted to make it harder for more people to get financing. So there was this less competition when you wanted to buy an asset. So a lot of this is, is some of it is, you know, circumstantial. Some of it is by design. Uh, in some places, their policies are more, are more fair than others. Uh, but, but I think that in, in, no matter how you slice it. So the other example I'll give you is like, when I was in Venezuela and people were going into Bitcoin, it wasn't just the rich people going into Bitcoin. It was everybody going into Bitcoin. It was taxi drivers. It was people that were chauffeurs. It was cleaners. It was people that had, you know, did housework. You know, everybody that had an open plug and that had a, a legacy computer with a GPU that could mine any type of token or anything was looking, was dusting it off and plugging it in. Uh, it, and it helped many people. Is many that people why they were able to? Yeah. Is that why they launched their own crypto? Because everyone was already buying Bitcoin, so they wanted to launch their own like state back. Uh, what is it? The Venezuelan digital the Bolivar Petro scam. Yeah, Petro, Petro coin scam. Well, so I have a. I have actually, knew, I had a guy opinions. on this podcast. I think I I had a guy on this podcast actually who was one of the developers, and uh, of the Petro dollar, and he like claims he we 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 had him on the show, but he we talked about how he was fooled, but he actually lived in a presidential palace and, and now he lives in, in here in Florida and a very nice guy, but he's been excommunicated. But what a crazy story that was. So the, the Petro, I have some strong opinions around that. Um, the Petro came out. So here's some interesting things about the Petro that people may not know. Um, I personally think that the Petro was a, an information campaign for a, a crooked arm of the police to go against legitimate miners in the country and to extort legitimate miners in the country. And I'll explain why I think this and why I have my reasons. Um, every week, or not every week, sorry, every year, uh, not almost like in a ceremonial manner, every time we were approaching Christmas, uh, the, the regime, the Venezuelan regime, uh, basically had to you know appease some sort of unrest because there was something that was starting to fail because they, just were, they were running out of money and they couldn't just you know print it. Uh, so every year towards Christmas, they would have some, and I would define this as a, as a raid on, on, a, on, a, on a private business, and then they would do a giveaway for the, for the country. So one, one year, they, they raided you know, the Venezuelan equivalent of Best Buy. And they said, uh, you know, now all the price, you know, this company was speculating on the prices of electronics, and we have now taken all over all of their inventory, and we're going to sell it at fair prices. They would sell it at pennies on the dollar. People would line up and it was a party. Like there were pictures of people walking out with 42 inch screen TVs for like 20 bucks. Uh, and, and so people, of course, people were like, yeah, you know, you know get those guys. Uh, and they would be lining up to get $20 electronics. So this happened in like, you know, 2016, 2015. Then there was like a shoe store the next year. Then the year after that, they brought in some, some, some pork and they gave everybody like free pork legs. Um, but by 2018, it, by the, by the, by Christmas, 2017, they were completely out of money. Like they were done. They could not get anything. And, and this inventory rates had happened so many times that no company were bringing inventory for Christmas. They were like, mm -mm, uh, uh, like not me. Christmas is coming. Like I'm not going to get raided. And so these guys rolled up to Christmas time and they are looking around and they're like, okay, guys, we have a lot of unrest. We don't have inventories to raid. You know, who are we going to raid? <laughs> you know? And there's like, any ideas, any takers? And they're probably, and they're going through the records and they're like, well, I'll show you some people that were importing into the Venezuela of this country. There's this huge, huge importing line out of this thing called Bitmain. 
I, you know, I don't know what these guys do, but it's like, look at this it's millions and millions of dollars that have come in. And then they're like, oh, miners. And then when Bitcoin's hitting 20K, they're like, wait a second, these computers print Bitcoin? And they're like, okay, well, we can't, you know, take those miners and give them away to the, to the court. And here's what happens. Venezuela always needs to have its bad cops well-fed because whenever unrest happens, they're like bad cops, shoot them up. Yeah. And, and if the bad cops are not down to play, your government is now, you know, yeah. we don't got any cronies. Yeah. And their main thing is to keep their bad cops happy, but they didn't really have anything to give to these bad cops and they didn't have money. So what they said is, here, listen, bad cops, there's some machines right now that print money. Um, we can't give you these machines because right now they belong to other people, but we will show you how to find them and we will give you carte blanche to essentially take them and reconnect them to you for yourself. Oh my God. And so, and so they're like, okay, well, how do we educate our crony cops around what a miner is and how to find them? And they're like, why don't we run some education campaigns? And the education campaigns were petro education campaigns. So if you go back and look at videos around petro ceremony, petro event, you'll find oddly that there are miners in every single event. And all of the events gravitate around the miners, what sounds they make, how much power they use, what they look like, how to find them. And guess what? The petro was not able to, the, the petro didn't even have a mining system. It didn't have ASICs. It didn't have GPUs. It didn't have anything. And guess what happens right after these petro campaigns start showing up? Friends like friends of mine and myself and people that had mines in Venezuela start getting knocks on the door from random people uh, that were just inquiring. Uh, and shortly after that, you started getting extortions. Uh, people were coming in, trying to take your miners, asking for money. Many times they would just take the miners and reconnect them for themselves. And it created a witch hunt uh, against Venezuela miners. So I think the petro was really nothing Holy more crap. than a scam. Yeah. That is an, that is an, that, if that's an untold story, if I've never heard one. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of people, I, and mind you, I'm there kind of this trying to just, scream at yeah. this guy. Uh, and I actually drafted a, an article uh, that, that's titled, The Petro is a Scam. That's, that's it. I just wanted people to read it. Uh, so many people were spitting out misinformation when the Petro came out. They said the Petro's backed by a, by a dollar or a barrel of oil. I'm like, did you oh read the document? The document says this, Charlie. The document says a petrol will be backed by a barrel of oil or any other commodity or replacement that the Venezuelan government deems fit. <laughs> that is very different than a barrel of oil. Yeah, that's very, very different. different. <laughs> this is like uh, one sorry. big fiat demise party that we're having that started 20, 30 years ago. This is just insane. And fiat yeah. literally just means by, you know, by federal decree. And so it's not the end of money or value, but I think we're, that we're seeing the cracks, like we were saying of like how much people, how much power a dozen people in a room have to decree what value is. And I think we're seeing the end of that. And my guest the other day was just saying, Charlie, all the U S government has to do to save the dollar. It's so simple. Just put a bunch of Bitcoin on the dollar balance sheet. And that's all you got to do because then it creates this beautiful cycle. And, and as long as it's, you know, in relation to you're, you're in great shape. It's an interesting way to, to, to look at it because I think it's really about what is the, like, how is your government managing, managing or mismanaging your reserves, right? Like um, there, I don't really know that I actually have this quote on my, on my Twitter or my Twitter, or actually I had this early back, but you know, bad money never dies. I think when, when fiat yeah. money dies, what, what becomes evident is not, how, is, is not how crappy the fiat system is. What becomes evident at that point is that the government has a monopoly on violence. Exactly. Um, because what's going to happen is that you're going to have people hitting the streets, protesting, getting mad, and the government is actually going to come, the government's going to have to make a decision. They're going to say, um, do we want to, you know, have a revolution in our hands and potentially have all of our families at risk uh, because guess what? They're going to come out with the pitchforks They're coming after us. Or do we want to get the police to sort of come out, keep the peace, let us work through it. They'll bet for, they'll, they'll want to keep the peace. And in an effort to protect themselves, they'll start doing 
you know, the, it, it'll come, it'll, it'll come to a clash. And, and I think yeah. in Venezuela, Venezuelans don't want to hold Bolivarists. Like ask any Venezuelan if they want to hold Bolivarists or not. The only reason they're still holding them is because they have guns pointed at their heads. And, and every time they protest, five or six kids get shot. And, and after that, a hundred other take a plane and they leave. And so you, you get, you keep creating this weaker and weaker society because everybody that has a backbone either has a bullet in their head or took a plane out. Unfortunately, Venezuela has been used as like a negative example in the American textbooks and press over the last two decades of like why socialism and communism is bad. But it's been at the, you know, at the behest of, of, oh, I don't know if that's the right term, but of the Venezuelan people. And we were talking earlier, Venezuela, if you look at the history, it was considered the Paris of Latin America at, at the time, well, like Buenos Aires, you know? And so you, which deals with all this crazy hyperinflation has its own problems too. Um, so you're talking about not a third world country. You know, we're talking about a country filled with smart people who are very bilingual, who are already educated with, with good infrastructure in a beautiful country that it could be great for so many different industries. So all it would take is for like a semi-responsible government where you have just a little bit of trust in our administration to take over. And at the same time, one of the beautiful things about Bitcoin is that we don't have any cracks. But Bitcoin has lost its PR war over the years. We've gone into bear markets because our biggest companies and businesses have gotten greedy and screwed us over from Mt. Gox to Quadriga. How do you prevent that? How do we need to prevent that as an industry? What happens in those type of situations? I think that's a great point. And I think that, you know, one thing that we should be very cognizant of is that we we cannot just recreate the old system on Bitcoin. Like if we do that, then we failed. Uh, I, I really believe that. I think that, you know, and, and this is one of the things where we were we were so gung-ho around having proof of reserves into Ledin. It's because Bitcoin enables everyone now to track where these assets are and to account for them more easily and to be more precise on you know, how things move and, and where things are. And for everyone to don't trust, verify. Yeah. That's oh, the whole yeah. purpose of this movement, right? Is that we now are one step more transparent than the previous system. If we were not, then there, the, then there would be no upgraded value proposition, right? Like we not only have to be, we, we have to be like Bitcoin, Bitcoin is permissionless. Of course, centralized entities have restrictions around what they can do, where they can offer things, who they can offer them to. But to the extent that we want to be like Bitcoin, we have to work to essentially bring down those barriers as much as we can, service as many people as we can in a compliant way, right? The other one is the transparency, right? Like, Bitcoin allows you to check where things are on chain. It allows you to, to verify if somebody's telling you the truth or not. And I, you know, one of the things that I, I think is, is that is shocking to me is how more companies in our industry don't have proof of reserves. It's, it's, it is the simplest way, in my view, or it's a very elegant way to show your clients that you're doing what you say you're going to be doing. Exactly. And, and, in a, and in an industry where we're plagued by, to your point, people that have had made mistakes along the way and that have caused you know, a lot of pain for a lot of clients. And that set our industry back, you know, every time something like that happens, it sets us back a few months at least, right? And, and, and Bitcoin, you know, and in human terms, that's like years. Even a year, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, if, if we can, and listen, it's a big undertaking. Like, I'm not going to play this off as it's like, oh, anyone can do it. It's so simple. It's a big undertaking. It requires buy-in from the entire organization. Uh, it, inquire, it requires you to have a very very buttoned up book uh, and basically have a tight operation. But that's how we should, that's the standard that we should be holding ourselves up to, right? Like that is how we're going to be able to sit down with regulators and have a beautiful framework where companies can flourish is by showing people that we can do things the right way. And, uh, and I think that that's the way we prevent this, right? Like the way we prevent this is by actually being different. It's not by saying we're different than not doing it. Right. It's about yeah. having an elevated proposition to that of why people are leaving in the first place. Right. And in fact, regulators actually kind of like it better. We had I was talking to a regulator and he said he said, yeah, we were trying to understand this this specific lending business. And 
we we got to the point where part of the heaviest regulation when it comes to lending, insurance, and banking is the reserves. It's the bonds. What money transmission? The money ha- there has to be a bond amount of money kept, you know, on reserve in case the company scams or goes away or or something happens. And the regulators are like, wait, in real time, Bitcoin can be verified. So that whole department in our regulator's office can theoretically go away or be down to one person. They like that's, it better. I, and that's <laughs> yeah. what I mean. Like, they, I, and listen, and I think that it's also easy to fall in this trap of, of you know, regulators and citizens are two different groups and they are just antagonistic no, they're the and they're never going to yeah. get along. It's the same. <laughs> like, you know, we are all people. And I think that, you know, we we as an industry need to understand that you know a lot of these people that are in these offices of the regulators they didn't have the same path that we did many of them haven't even you know they're just learning about bitcoin they don't really understand how it's helping people across the world so there is an element of education and it's not just going to be you know we show up and, and and say hey guys we're here you know get comfortable and flip a switch it's going to be a process it's going to be back and forth it's going to be iterative and i think that process really will culminate when our generation is in office, right? Yes, because at that, that point, we'll we'll have you know that's not too far away, you know. In in you know ten years time, there's going to be Bitcoiners in office, and it's going to be a very different policy landscape, uh, you know, when we get there. Yeah, it's it's one thing from turning a politician into a Bitcoiner, but it's another thing when someone became a politician, but they were a Bitcoiner first. They had that's where they got their spurs and they did everything. That's going to be. A crazy world, you know. I want to. I want to uh, kind of ask you. Ask you lastly, um, and you were alluding to to it earlier. I'm just curious. So, you know, the last three decades, last thirty years, there hasn't been the word inflation. Was to our generation, like you said, was just this number that was always between one and two percent that the government came out with every year, and it just tracked normal amount of appreciation. But inflation is a very scary word to everyone outside of America. And now to Americans, it's getting scary. It's a scary word. We're seeing inflation like here mostly in gas prices, but food prices, things like that. Um, uh, uh, th- travel, things that would cost a certain amount, can, you know, real estate, especially cars, things like that. What are you seeing in Canada? Is it worse? It's the same. It's very similar. Uh, Canada housing prices are through the roof. Uh, there, uh, there is no inventory of vehicles. So same issue as in the U.S. Used vehicle prices through the roof. Uh, no inventory of actual vehicles. Um, I, I just got a message from a friend telling me that I should go get my winter tires now because they are expecting shortages of winter tires uh, for the winter season. So we're we're starting to see a lot of the same. Uh, the same trends play out. Uh, I think Canada and the U.S. were actually quite close in, in yeah. how much extra money they printed, and uh, and I don't, I don't think the stimulus in Canada were as aggressive as in the U.S. But we are, but because the U.S. is exporting its inflation, yeah. that puts pressure even on, on more pressure on Canada. I'm sorry. So, hey, man. No, how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. We, we, we don't even, I, I, I'm off, you know, I, I don't have any beef with Canadian dollars, you know, I'm Bitcoin, you know, <laughs> um, but, but it, it's, it's not, uh, Canada is not by in any ways sort of uh, spared from this wave. I don't think any modern economy is going to be uh, spared from this wave. I, I was listening to a podcast last night uh, with a, a Goldman Sachs commodity analyst saying how the crisis in coal prices in China is basically going to lead to higher gas prices in Europe, and that's going to lead to higher oil prices all over the world. And I'll tell you what happens when oil prices shoot up. Like, find one one supply chain that is not impacted by yeah. higher oil prices. So, I think the writing's on the wall for prolonged inflation. Uh, it's. I do think just to, to take off the just to the not, not come across as alarmist. I've always believed inflation is an economical phenomenon. Like. It, it, it will happen if you change certain inputs. I think hyperinflation is a political phenomenon. Hyperinflation is just people have all, have lost faith in the system and they are now voting with their wallets and they just do not want to hold that asset anymore. It's, it's full loss of faith in the system where I, I don't think in the US we are there. I think we're still at the sort of like the economic issue 
uh, part of the spectrum. The fact that we're even talking about it, though, in seriousness is what's scary. Because like you said, America it was supposed to be the last fiat domino to fall. Yeah, it, I would. I was not expecting the conversation to show up this fast. And, uh, you know, back in the few early days of COVID, I had some like PTSD waves of Venezuela where I was going into supermarkets and like there were empty shelves, you know, toilet paper was running out and, and you start seeing people lining up for products and things running out. I, you know, to me, it was a little bit like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> uh, this Bring is back some bad memories to happen right now. Uh, but uh, I hope that this is just a sort of a blip and, and this transitioning into Bitcoin is, is more gradual, kind of like El Salvador transition rather than we all had to do it because everything else collapsed. Uh, you know, I, I think that might be a, a, a better, a better yeah. experience for everybody. Mauricio, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on Untold Stories today. You're the founder and chief strategy officer at LedIn.io. You've created so many uh, products and services that allow people to never have to sell their Bitcoin and also earn interest on their Bitcoin and USDC and, and all these other, like the B2X product and all these other products. Thank you for, for coming on the show. Thank you for sponsoring Untold Stories. I was telling you that this show gives me so much purpose every day. And what you enable is the ability for me every day to get on with these guests, be able to, to teach and educate all of our listeners all over the world. And what I love about this show is that the majority of my listeners are not in the U.S. This is a, this is a only 40% something U.S. show, even less than that. So who you're t we're talking to the world here and you're teaching and we're, we're taking them out of the control of the people that are constantly trying to steal from them. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. And thanks for all the listeners for listening to Untold Stories today. Thank you, Charlie. It was a pleasure. I'll see ya.